Jimmy Governor was born at Denison Town in 1875. He had an education at Gulgong and could read and write when he left school, an achievement even for a white child in those days. He was a hard worker, a contractor who employed others, worked for the police at Castlas where he did all the hard work while his white colleagues took the credit for his good work. This is the Jimmy Governor song. Governor's name was flashed out across the telegraph. The castle raised brave pioneers, bolted up their doors, schemed how they could set a snare to go round a bird so bold and rare as a good and nothing black who dare trade them blow for blow. horror of their crime enraged the nation and the time when Lawson in the bulletin raised Federation's flag the slaughter of the curry race stepped up its deadly closing pace to tame the bush and clear the stage all for the rights of man Winter's moon shone through the guns, a night the killing had begun When Sarah Morby's spiteful tongue snapped some final thread He and Joey clubbed her down and left her lying in the house The children lying in the yard, the others all but dead was done, the hunt was on, the countryside rose up in arms, they came from near, they came from far to bring two youths to heal, but crime's no worse than many had done, with arsenic and scatter gun, on a sporting Saturday afternoon, coon hunting in the hills. At Sportsman's Hollow on Monday, then Mackay at work on his boundary fence was the next to suffer their cruel revenge as they cut out through the range. Wide of the towns and off the road, a gun, a horse, some food and clothes, they'd appear in a clearing that fade like ghosts, travel a week in a day. The fences up and down with hardly a noise or a mark on the ground. Bogey west of Marawa, where they slayed a young wife and a child. But all go gone by the light of the moon, they skirted the racetrack round the town. Yamble Goomer and Kaji Gong and the troopers hours behind. By month and up and down they were seen to the west, to the north and south. Maury Dabo and Braga and east within sight of the sea. Awakening terror wherever they went, from Tamba Springs to Musselbrook. Three thousand civilians and mounted police and the governor boy still free. Yes, the governor boy still free. Upon their head was more than two blacks had ever fetched Soon saw Jimmy caught and brought in And Joe lying dead in a field A darling hearst in 1901 In the bloom of a youth young Jimmy was hung He went to his death at peace at last With God himself and man With God himself and man Jimmy did everything to be accepted into white society, but was humiliated, cheated, and excluded at every turn. It was said that Aborigines were lazy and drank too much. But Jimmy had a reputation as a hard worker and did not drink. Jimmy also played cricket. At a cricket match at Wallah, 
a Mr. O'Brien humiliated Jimmy in front of a large group of people by pushing him into a creek. O'Brien eventually went on Jimmy's list of people to kill when he was on the run. It was O'Brien's wife and child who were to die at the hands of the Governor brothers. If Australians today are aware of the massacres and dispossessions so many years earlier, the governors must have known people still living who talked about the events. This would have built up a general resentment among Jimmy and his family. A major event that shaped the lives and future of so many people was when Jimmy married Ethel Page, a 15-year-old white girl who was working in Gulgong as a domestic servant. They were married in a building at the back of the church. Why? is for others to ponder. Both Jimmy and Ethel felt the prejudice of Gulgong and they decided to take up a contract cutting fence posts for John Morby who was building up his farm property at Breelong near Gilgandra. They took Jimmy's brother Joe and another Aboriginal man, Jackie Underwood, to work on the contract. Several other relatives eventually set up a camp not far away from Jimmy's campsite on the property. From the outset, they all became the target of the white prejudice, particularly from the women folk on the property. Ethel felt the humiliation most from Mrs Sarah Morby, her daughter Grace, and a trainee teacher called Helen Kurtz. The situation became worse when Jimmy and his team split 100 fence posts. John Morby decided that half the posts were not up to standard and condemned them. That is, he only paid for half. The old exploitation had followed them. Now after condemning their posts and then refusing to pay, nothing must do old Morby but to start carting those posts away. Of course, this nettled the darkies, so Jimmy and Joe went down, and Morby, to save further trouble, he agreed to give them a crown. Now Morby, he had no right in touching those posts at all. No doubt, he thought he was cunning, but it stuck in the darkies' gall. Things became even worse when Ethel went to Dubbo to pick up her baby boy who was being minded by her parents. She called in to show the baby to the women who humiliated her by making fun of the child's appearance. Sam Ellis, a hawker, operating out of Mudgee, who often camped with the governors on Breelong Station, recalled the event. Governor's baby had been living in Dubbo up to this time when Mrs Governor on a saddle horse went to go and get it. Mrs Governor landed back at Breelong with the baby on the horse on a rainy day cold, hungry and miserable at the door of the homestead. Grace Morby and Helen Kurtz took the baby in to warm it by the fire while Mrs Governor was unsaddling the horse. She was also watching them through the window, criticising the baby and laughing and making fun of it. She then went into the house, grabbed the baby and with angry words left and walked three miles to the camp. This was the breaking point. A cup of tea at that time may have prevented an awful tragedy. They were also short of groceries that had been promised by John Morby. All these grievances were discussed around the campfire on the night of Friday the 20th of June 1900. Court records tell us they also talked about becoming bush rangers. We also know Jimmy sent a list of people he intended killing to the local newspaper. There were two houses on the property, one where the women and children were sleeping and a partly constructed one where John Morby and his son were sleeping during construction. At his own trial, Jimmy Governor gave this account of what happened on that fateful night. When I got down to Morby's, they were in bed. So I sang out to Mr Morby. I said, Mr Morby, are you in bed? Mr Morby said to me, Yes, Jimmy, we're about to turn in. So he came out to me. I said, Please, Mr Morby, I want a bag of flour up in the morning and a bag of sugar. So he says, 
All right, Jimmy. I'll send it up to you in the morning, or sometime tomorrow. So he asked me inside. I says, No thanks, Mr. Morby. It's getting late, and I'll get back. So he says, Good night to me, and I says, Good night, Mr. Morby. So I went up to the house, and I says, Are you in, Mrs. Morby? So I says, Did you say to my missus, I says, that a white woman who marries a black fella ought to be shot, I says. Did you ask her what sort of thing I have, black or white, or what colour it was? And with that Mrs Morby and Miss Kurtz wheeled around and laughed at me, like, with a sneering laugh. And before I had the words out of my mouth, I struck Mrs Morby with my nulla nulla. And Mrs Kurtz says, Pooh, you black rubbish. You... You want shooting for marrying a white woman. With that, I hit her with my hand in the jaw and knocked her down. Then I got annoyed. And I don't know nothing after that. From then on, Jimmy knew his fate was sealed. They killed four more children, went back to their camp, left Ethel and the baby behind and set out for Golgong where they had friends. Jackie Underwood had a crook leg and a bad eye and could not keep up with them. They left him behind and he was captured near Mandurin the next day, Saturday, July the 21st, 1900. The brothers made it to Golgong on the Saturday night when they possibly slept in a cave on the property of Mr James Cross. Then on the Sunday night they slept in the house of family friends, Mr and Mrs Wade, at Slapdash Creek, now called Chinaman's Crossing, not far from Golgong. On the Monday morning, they walked over the Great Dividing Range to where I now live, Sportsman's Hollow, where Joe murdered Mr Alexander Mackay. Mackay's grave is in Golgong Cemetery. The headstone on Mackay's grave reads, Brutally murdered by the blacks. They then made their way to Wallah, where they killed Kieran Fitzpatrick, Mrs Elizabeth O'Brien and Baby O'Brien. That was the end of their killings, but not their crimes. For the next several months they led the police and up to 3,000 civilians on a merry chase that covered an area from Moree to the coast and many parts in between. They had shootouts with police and others and robbed many of the abandoned farmhouses which were empty because of sheer terror on the part of the settlers. Jimmy had a list of his proposed victims published. It is interesting to note that most on the list had employed Jimmy at some time. Jimmy made a point of deliberately humiliating police at every opportunity. Eyewitness accounts portray them as superhuman beings that could not be captured. People still marvel at the ingenious methods they use to hide their tracks and avoid capture. (laughs) 